Hello and welcome to the Film Mavericks podcast. Uh, I am excited because today we are talking with John and Kay Snyder from Atlanta. Uh, they're with, uh, wait, is it J? Crap, I forgot. Is it J and K Productions or J and K? What's the name? We're just called, we're, we're just called Jonathan and Kay. Okay, Jonathan and Kay. I remember seeing the J and K logo, um, but I've actually been following as as terrible as that is. I forgot their their company name. I've actually been following their work for a long time, for the last several years. And John and I have had a uh, a bromance going on for the last couple of years uh, on Facebook Messenger. And uh, always just interested in hearing more about what they're up to because they've really positioned themselves extremely well as um, really the, the top filmmakers in their market in a number of ways and, um, and, and really have seen some amazing fruit from that where they're booking, you know, uh, five figure weddings. They're, they're doing really incredible work at high end weddings. Uh, primarily in the Atlanta area. And so today I wanted to talk about that. And really kind of the idea is about how do you take yourself from whatever place that you're at to really position yourself as the one of the top, if not the top wedding filmmaker in your city, in your market. So uh, John and Kay, thanks for coming on today. Thanks for having us. Yeah, we're excited to do this with you. Hey, Jordan, let, let me start off by saying that uh, you are an amazing leader in the field. You're a, a stellar videographer. You have so much insight, wisdom, and uh, hey, man, I'm having trouble reading your handwriting. What would you say here? <laughs> I just wanted to see how many uh, cliches I can throw in here. Uh, that was uh, that was awesome. Thank you. <laughs> um, just, just to start off on my slightly humorous side, Kay is a more serious one. <laughs> Yeah. Well, if you're watching the video, um, you see he was holding up a piece of paper. I don't know if anything was written on it or not, but uh, <laughs> that was good. It's just handwriting. I swear. So I, I think since we're since we're starting off on a on a humorous note here, let's uh, let's go ahead and throw this out there. You guys are really positioning yourselves at the top end of a market that uh, that a lot of people would say Ray Roman just moved to your market. He's the guy who has been widely considered, um, you know, one of the top, if not the top um, rated, like high end wedding filmmaker in the world. So let's talk about, let's talk about that, about that maybe. That's sort of an interesting <laughs> subject of uh, him moving into y'all's camp. So it's actually kind of funny. Uh, we reached out to him when he moved here. I think unless he reached out to us, I can't remember which happened first, um, but he let us know right away. He's like, Hey, I'm not here to like take over the market. And we knew that because he is worldwide. That's his market is the world. Yeah. <laughs> so where he lives doesn't really affect us um, or other videographers in the, in the city. I don't think. No, it is true. I mean, <clears throat> you know, when you follow Ray and what he's doing, I mean, he's, he is all over the place. I mean, it doesn't mean it doesn't sting a little bit when I see him post a wedding from my local market, working with a planner who I've worked with. But, you know, for the most part, I think he might only do like one, maybe two weddings in Atlanta. I mean, honestly, it hasn't changed at all since he's moved here. Yeah. Awesome. Well, let's do this because I know that in the last several years, um, you guys have really done a lot to elevate what you're doing, both in the work um, as well as that, as in your perception in the market, how people are perceiving you. And that's what I want a lot of this conversation to be about because mm -hmm. I think for our listeners who are wedding and event filmmakers, that's, that's sort of the goal, right? Um, in fact, speaking of Ray Roman, when I had him on the show a while back, one of the things he said is like, if you're not positioning yourself as one of the top three, and then he said, but really the top two and really the number one wedding filmmaker in your market, then you're in trouble. And uh, I thought that was sort of a fascinating perspective. And I think it's certainly something that everyone would probably aspire to. And you guys, I think, have really accomplished that. So talk to me about this journey of sort of being at a, a very different place, let's say three years ago, and what were some of the strategies that you guys put into place to begin to propel yourselves, like thinking, okay, this is where we're trying to go. How are we going to get there? What are some of the things that you guys did to, to start moving in that direction? Can I start? Sorry. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have something. So it's funny since you did bring up Ray. Just speak a little bit closer. To that is um, the catalyst to our growth is that we were actually listening. We were on our way to a wedding that was kind of far away. And we were listening to uh, one of his courses that we had purchased um, just to kind of get pumped up and just kind of uh, reevaluate our business. It's just something to listen to on a long car ride. And it was amazing to hear. That was the first time I felt like, oh, as a wedding videographer, we're like a professional. We're not just like a vendor. Like Ray, the way he talks, he demands respect. He demands to be treated like a professional. Um, and so when I heard that, like I felt like there was a shift inside of me. Um, I don't know if there's as much of a shift inside of John. For me, it was really huge. And um, I think part or a, a huge majority of our success is all about mindset. Mm. And anybody's success is about mindset. Jordan's going to listen to this and be like, I don't know why I spend so much time talking to John. I need to go to Kay for more of this uh, insight and wisdom. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that definitely is true. I mean, I don't think that that what Kay was talking about, the car ride, was was really kind of where it hit for me. Honestly, you know, I, I'd been to a couple of Ray's um, seminars, or the things he had done locally. And, um, you know, it really did it, – it, it, some things he said about that, kind of what you're saying, Jordan, about being like the top three, top two in your market really struck me because I remember having a conversation with Kay about it. And, you know, there really, we realized there really was no kind of top dog in the market at the time. And, and I, I should say this, this really goes back almost four or five years ago, not so much three. And what's really interesting about this is that um, I actually see routinely on the forums, you know, people talking about how they want to leave their market because there, you know, nobody charges more than X amount of dollars. And, you know, that's kind of what Atlanta was, you know, five years ago, hmm. you know, um, five years ago, Atlanta was, um, nobody charged much more than 2,500, maybe 3000. I mean, if you got a $4,000 wedding back then, I mean, that, that was kind of like, all right, where do you want to go on vacation type mindset? We were pretty blown away. There was this one company that charged $5,500 for a wedding. We're like, how are they getting that much money for a wedding? Yeah, and that wasn't that too, that long ago. So all that to say, it's just like, you know, even to encourage um, your listeners that if you are in that type of market where there is, you know, if you're saying to yourself, well, nobody charges that much or people won't spend that much money in my market. I mean, th the reality is, sure, maybe you won't book 20 weddings or 30 weddings at that type of a price point that you, you wish you were at. But I guarantee you that there's, a, there's a, a, at least a huge potential for at least a handful or so in that. So is that the sort of the mindset that you guys have taken then? Is it, I'm going to shoot a whole lot less weddings and just charge a higher price point? Or are you still shooting a lot? Um, yeah, what does that sort of dynamic look like? Well, we weren't thinking about shooting less. What were you going to say? I was just, um, well, I feel like I... I, I mean, how many, do you have booked, <laughs> how many do you have booked in 2019? What does 2019 look like in terms of, I mean, how many do you have booked? How many do you think you'll book this year? We have, I believe, 18 booked. I have two that are possibly going to book within, an, you know, probably by the time this podcast is over. Which is high for us. Like Which this is, is we're like, whoa, we need to raise our prices because we're mm -hmm. already almost completely booked and it's January. Okay, it's February now. That's an entirely different subject though, raising your pricing. <laughs> yeah. That, that'll be the next time. <laughs> so, but you're talking about, uh, you're just talking about probably, probably doing like two weddings a month on, on average, like 24, 25 weddings. Is that kind of the goal this year? What is the goal this My year? My goal, you see, the K and I have different goals. I mean, her <laughs> goal was to do like five weddings this year. Yeah. Um, my goal, see, the thing is, I don't think to myself how many weddings I want to do. I think to myself, or like, I don't think to myself, okay, we're going to book 12 weddings and then we stop. I think to myself, you know, what is our goal for amount of weddings and what can I, you know, and if we're booking too many weddings, what can I raise our prices to, to kind of slow the bookings down so that way it naturally kind of phases itself out. And I actually did that for 2019 and I've raised my prices three times over the last two or three months. And I've now just even dropped our bottom package altogether. And, you know, we're still booking and it's it making us a little nervous. I'm going to have to find a good editor to uh, go through our stuff. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Awesome. So, um, yeah, that's interesting. Actually, there, there's, there's something I would like to add to that actually. Yeah. Um, I feel like you had asked us and then we kind of somehow got off track. Um, 
But so when we started raising our prices or when we knew that we wanted a shift in our business and be con considered a professional, not just a vendor, and to be taken seriously and to be able to raise our prices, um, we were like, okay, what do we need to do differently to elevate our, our films? What do we need to do? Like, what, how can our cameras upgrade? How can our lighting get better? How can our audio get better? Um, and we really just had a look at everything, even the editing, um, education, stuff that we needed to catch up on. And get, so it wasn't just our film stayed the same and we raised our prices. We, uh, we were striving to get better to meet that price point as well. Absolutely. I, I think that's really interesting. I actually recently, um, and I wonder, based on something I heard John say earlier, it uh, sounds like maybe you guys have done this, but recently I, I felt like I, I had kind of lost touch with where our market was because I just hadn't really looked in several years. And I had, I didn't really know like who some of the big players were and where people's price points were at and what was like the quality of films that were out there. So I actually made a big spreadsheet where I took like the top like 25 people that I could easily find through Google and the not and stuff like that. And just made like this big spreadsheet where I like, God, the people in my market would love to see this document that I made because <laughs> I put, you know, I put their names, the name of the, the their company. And then I put like, uh, their different prices that they have that, that, that are listed, whatever's listed. And then I gave them like a rating on like the quality of the film kind of thing. And just so I could see like who's making good stuff and what are the price points. And it's, it's a very, it was very enlightening to see, um, because I do feel like, uh, based on what I discovered in terms of who's like easily visible online, uh, my market's, you know, kind of in a similar place where like most of the, the people are positioning themselves kind of more that, uh, lower mid, uh, price point. And there wasn't, uh, anybody who I saw that really like stood out dramatically in terms of, of those price points and things. So did you guys go through a process like that in order to make some of these discoveries and start to try to think about how you reposition yourself? Of course, you know, because one of the one of the first things we did, I mean, with that, you know, the whole I mean, the whole process that, that was definitely a part of it. We broke it down into kind of like, you know, kind of some creative changes we can make to our business as well as business changes. And part of the business changes was really doing a good evaluation of the market and where we fit into the market and then how we can, you know, then price ourselves. But I mean, realistically, what, what happened before all that happened was just that it, we, we made a lot of changes with kind of like our films, with, um, with um, our workflows, just to kind of make a better film. Then, then we focus on the business side of it. And between the two, those is kind of like how we, how we did every, how, how we kind of accomplish our goals of doing that. So let's talk about the, like the quality of the filmmaking side of it then. What did you do to sort of have like an honest evaluation of what you were doing and how it needed to improve in order for you to position yourselves where you are today? So I'm the editor and creative and that's why he put the mic towards me. <laughs> he was like, she's going to take this one. Honestly, um, so I mean, we've already brought him up before, but we are huge followers of Ray Roman. And so we've done his education courses um, and everything that we were filming, I was trying to compare to his stuff. I'm like, okay, what would he do differently? How hard would he fight to get the shot? Um, and like, what would he do in each situation that I felt like we were put in? And also his exposure, his what he's focusing on, and you know, I realized simple things like we were shooting really shallow for a while. When you look at his films, he actually doesn't shoot shallow. You know, usually it's a beautiful scene, and you want the whole thing in focus. Um, a lot of people make the mistake of shooting really shallow, and then you miss focus a lot, and so you just have kind of soft films. Um, so it was just stuff like that that I just started to notice um, and make changes with actual shooting. So WWRD. Right. I mean, but aside from um, that, too, you know, there, there was a lot that went into like equipment of like, you know, um, and I, I apologize for those who are watching. I made some notes just because I wanted to make sure I went over it all. But, um, you know, one of the things we focus on better cinematics, kind of what Kay was saying, you know, kind of WWRD. D. And uh, <laughs> we focus we focus on better cinematics. And, you know, the, the first thing I want to say is, you know, because a lot of people are like, oh, well, you know, who cares what cinematics stories where it's at? 
people want good cinematics. Even if it's a good story, they still want good cinematics. I mean, you know, they want eye candy, and the bride and groom want to look good. If they don't look good in their film, that's it. I mean, yeah, it's a deal breaker. Right. So <clears throat> with that, you know, we focus on getting better audio, better cameras, integrating drones more effectively, integrating stabilizers. I mean, th this is probably in like 2015, 2016 that we were really trying to do this. You know, one of the first things we did was um, we integrated using our own microphone, <clears throat> which is actually, for those who are watching, this is the microphone in the shot. But just even including better audio really helped us. It kind of, it made it, it made it more noticeable that how good our toasts were sounding. And then, you know, even just having better toasts made us use more of our audio in the films, which really helped the story. Um, you know, having better lights, you know, integrating, um, upgrading our lights and integrating uh, two LEDs in the mix. Also, we're always looking for good lighting, which is something that we learned from photographers. And yeah. photographers are always out looking for the best lighting possible. You know, when they're doing, doing preparations, lead them to a window. Uh, when they're doing the, um, the, the, the bride and groom stuff, like the, when they're together for the first time, you know, try to find some good light. Don't just shoot in some nasty conditions or, you know, where it's kind of spotty lighting, stuff like that. And most photographers love it when the videographer actually knows something about lighting. Yeah. So that way you're working with them and they're usually in agreement unless it's a photographer that just likes using flash for everything. Right. But um, for the most part, we're on the same page about wanting to find good light. Um, but I did want to add to what you were saying, John. Um, so when we were trying to elevate our brand and increase our prices, all this gear upgrade we, the reason it was necessary is because we had to start acting like a high dollar company before we were actually a high dollar company. Mm, yeah. um, if we wanted to, if we wanted to be in a certain genre, we had to look like we were already there before we could start charging it. So, that's a great, that's a great input. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like the whole uh, mindset of, you know, don't wait for the high dollar film, high dollar budgets to come in to justify your films to them. Start creating high dollar films and then, you know, even if the price tag of those films wasn't high dollar, I mean, anyone has a potential to come in for a $1,500 wedding. You can make a $10,000 looking wedding for a $1,500 budget. Mm -hmm. And just, you, I mean, it's a kind of like everything always comes back to the, the fishing analogies. You know, if you want high dollar weddings, you put out the bait for high dollar weddings, which is amazing looking films. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amazing looking and great storyline, of course. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, let's let's talk about light because I think that that is that is a huge deal um, when you're trying to get into a higher end market that I feel like most people who are going to struggle to get there uh, don't understand how valuable good lighting is. I think uh, most most like like you kind of said you learned a lot of this from wedding photographers and most of the wedding photographers we work with understand this of course not all of them do but most of them do and i feel like most of the wedding videos that i see uh it's it, that's definitely like one of the weaker points mm -hmm. um a lot of times it's and i think i think part of it is because continuous lighting is scary to some people um they're worried of what people will think about them if they're using continuous light mm -hmm. they're worried what responses will be from their clients, from uh, guests, from wedding planners, whatever it is. Um, and so they're like, well, I'll just get a camera that can, you know, handle really high ISOs. And so I'll still have a clean image, um, you know, at 10,000 ISO. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so talk to me about, talk to me about how your opinion is so different from that. Do you want to go? Um, I don't know. You go ahead and I'll see if anything sparks. Was that an in and out cup? <laughs> no, that's a Freddy's cup. <laughs> <laughs> Just had to check. I saw, I thought, it is, I thought it it is red and white, trees. so it, it's easily perceived. But for those who are watching, that says Freddy's, <laughs> which is awesome. Uh, so um, regarding lighting, you know, when we when we started, I mean, We've always integrated um, a couple of cheap tungsten lights into into the mix, and for the most part, we've for the always reception. yeah for the reception. We've always had uh, some tungsten, so we've never really gone straight out, you know, just relying on the camera's ISO capabilities. But I, I would say that you know we we actually shifted for a little while. We started 
it, it, the whole thing about lighting kind of started when we got into doing wedding photography and we actually thought we were going to kind of do wedding photo and video, which we did for a couple of years and we kind of refocused back on video. Um, but it, it, you know, lighting starts with, um, Lighting starts with just, you know, the bride and group prep, you know, f going towards like the, the natural light sources, not having to rely on the camera's ISO capabilities, you know, because the thing is, it's like having, we, we try to bring contrast out between, you know, it's contrast and depth. You know, we're not, we're probably not the most articulate people in the world. You've probably had some, you know, amazing people in, in the past who've kind of really gone into the science behind it, but just high contrast and depth just makes for, more, for a more beautiful image. Yeah. And I think expo exposure has a lot to do with it too. Um, I feel like a lot of videographers blow out the highlights, blow out the sky. Um, and so that is like a hard rule of ours is like, if the sky looks blue in your eyeball, when you look at it, it better look blue in camera. I don't care how dark everything else looks. Yeah. The sky needs to be blue. Yep. Um, and so even with preparations, I mean, you were talking about natural light with preparations. I've brought in an led light on a stand, um, into bride prep. And I was a little nervous, but, um, and I just, this was actually just two months ago. That was like the last wedding we did. No, two weddings ago. Um, it was a real dark, kind of like a cabin, the bride was getting ready in the kitchen and it was one of those things that it just was not pretty. Um, so I had to bring in a, in a light just to get those pretty skin tones on her for makeup and stuff. Um, but also I brought it out when she got her dress on and she was out in this like living room that was really dark and the photographer loved it. Like I always ask the photographer, Hey, does this bother you? I can turn it down or change it if this bothers you. And usually they're like, Oh my God, I love it. I can shoot natural light now. I don't need my flash. And that makes most photographers happy. Um, and the fact that, again, that this whole this whole mindset that switched for us, I used to feel like a burden on people. I used to feel like I was an inconvenience or people didn't want me there. They didn't want me to, like they hired a videographer and yet I was ashamed to be a, a videographer. Mm. But since that mindset switched, I know I'm there to do a job. They want to look amazing in their films and they hired me for a reason and I'm going to make them look good. Yep. And so I can confidently come in and bring that light and they know, oh, she's professional. She's making sure I look good. Yep. Um, so it really just kind of depends on your approach and your mindset um, coming into the situation, I think. Yeah. So, and then same thing for the reception lighting. Um, we have upgraded lights uh, since, you know, years ago. You're talking about the little cheapo tungsten lights that we had. Um, but we always light our receptions um, and any key, any any key elements that I don't know. I feel like I'm losing it. You can. <laughs> yeah, what, what you know, I feel like I feel like that mindset shift is is huge. Mm -hmm. Like I remember making that shift and realizing that like I was doing everybody a massive favor by lighting all my scenes. You know, like I'm the same way. Like I'll, I'll bring in a practolite. Um, with a, a Vagabond mini battery so it's super portable and I'll just bring that with me into bride prep, into the groom prep. Like everywhere I go, that thing comes with me. It goes with me outside to shoot portrait sessions, you know, so that I can get that blue sky and get the bride and groom's face lit mm -hmm. and make that pop. Mm -hmm. And the photographers love me for it, mm -hmm. you know. And of course the couples will too because they're going to see how amazing it looks after the fact. But... Um, I've, I've yet to have, I've yet to have a photographer who, who's complained about it. I've certainly had some like wedding, other wedding vendors, like the bartender or somebody, you know, like <laughs> some people who like don't really make too big of an effect on, on my business <laughs> uh, when I'm not going to make a decision based on what the bartender thinks. But as much as, as much as, uh, I love them and they're probably wonderful people. Um, <laughs> but I think that having that mindset shift of, I'm the professional. I know what it takes to make a great film and I'm going to do whatever's necessary to make that great film. I think that's a super important mindset shift to make. So I love mm -hmm. that you're talking about that just in terms of not just practicality of, you know, I'm going to do this because this, but just like actually sh shifting your mindset because that's going to change so many different things. Not just this one deal we're talking about here with lighting. Mm hmm. And yeah, you were mentioning about like, you got to fight for it. You know, part of what we get paid to do is fight f to make sure that th those different elements really come together. Yeah. You know, it's not by, uh, you know, for the people who are experienced and have been doing this and for the people who are really producing the higher end stuff, 
you know, I'm sure we would all say that it's not by accident that these things happen. That it's you know, beautiful, you mean? That it's beautiful. It's you know, it's accident. like we're out there fighting for these elements some days. Some days they happen by chance. Some days we're just literally fighting people to make it happen. Mm-hmm. Not literally fighting, but, you know. <laughs> we're asking the makeup artist to move um, to better lighting. And if they can't, then we'll just grab a few shots by the window after she's finished with makeup. Or um, I feel like that's the biggest part. Bride prep is really hard with lighting sometimes. The rest of the day. And then we have have started lighting the ceremony, too. Hmm. Um, and we've stopped asking. I think we've kind of stopped asking permission. We used to feel like we were, like, ruining, like, the ambiance. The, the ambiance and we don't definitely don't want to ruin the ambiance. But we don't want to, like, the designer put up this beautiful candlelight thing. And we were like, oh, my gosh, are we going to ruin this? But we would just put a soft glow in the back. And it just makes all the difference in the world um, for the ceremony um, and for the, uh, the vows and everything. Because that's, like, the key point that we use in our films. But um, anyway, let, let's talk more about that, because I think that that is uh, probably pretty foreign to most people. Um, I've had maybe like three or four ceremonies in my career that I've, I've also lit um, for various reasons. But it's definitely not like my go to. Like I don't walk into, um, you know, a ceremony expecting that I'm going to light it. Mm-hmm. It's more like if I walk in and I'm like, Oh crap! <laughs> then I'm gonna light mm-hmm. it, you know. Um, so, is is that become has that become your default to light ceremony? No, definitely not the no, default. I don't know. Like I, all the ballroom ceremonies that we've been doing, we light them as the processionals, the brides coming down. We want her lit as she's coming down. So we've started putting a light in the corner, mm. past you know off off center. Yeah, that would get the processional. Then we we turn that off when the ceremony starts because we don't want to blind the guest. It's just for the processional John to run and turn it off. So are you using, are you using lighting for key at all? Um, like during the ceremony? Just for the processional. We'll okay. kind of spot. No, 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 we'll no, no, no. There's a, there's for a lot of Jewish weddings that we do. Um, that would say that's probably one of the bigger ones that we are continuously doing lighting for because for anyone who's in your audience has done a Jewish wedding, you know, you're doing it after sundown. And they, they have the hoopah up, up. And so it's just like, and then all of a sudden you have like a 20 people who are kind of like standing around on the outside, you know, blocking all, all light coming in. So we, we've, uh, cut, we've, the last few ones, we've definitely put a light going inside to kind of be able to get a little, little illumination. Like the last five or six weddings we've all, we've lit the ceremony, except for the outdoor ones. Which what? I, I think we've lit the last several weddings, like five or six weddings, except for the outdoors. There outdoors. have been an, a lot in a lot recently that we've yeah. lit. Yeah. Hmm. No, that's interesting. I've, I've, the only times I've ever, I've ever attempted that was just for a key light. If it was like outdoors and it was sunset or it was in a room that was like backlit by like floor to ceiling windows, things like that, that I've been in where I have brought in some lights uh, because the dynamic range was just going to be too much. And I'm like, uh, I used to not be this way, but in the last several years have become like a huge stickler for saving my highlights. Um, and I just preach that endlessly to my team and I feel like her work has gotten so much better because of it. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's interesting perspective. I love that. You know, part of what we were, um, saying before about a shift in the mindset is that, you know, in the past we used to do a lot of asking, you know, mm-hmm. ask the bride and groom. Like, you know, as, like assuming they're going to say no or assuming we're going to get in trouble. But the thing is, it's like we, we've come to realize that the bride and groom just assume that we're going to be the professionals and we're we need to, uh, they just we want do to, what we need to do. do what we need to do. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, it's more of a, a shifting of that mindset of do kind of like all, all these different things to, throughout the day that will just like be a little tweak here, a little tweak there just to make it better. And by the way, I apologize. I feel like we're, I mean, we haven't even got onto the business stuff and I'm not sure how much time we have left. <laughs> Hey, no, this is great. I love this conversation. Well, if you'd like to shift over there, we could certainly do that. Maybe let's talk about, um, let's, let's talk about, let's talk about pricing yourself in a market that you feel like is undervalued. So I think I hear this complaint a lot from people as they say that, you know, my market just can't support that, you know, uh, and you know, what, whatever that market is, you guys were in a market that, um, at least at the time, the perception was it couldn't support that because nobody was doing it. So, how do you, how do you think about pricing in a different way than that? Because nobody else in your market was doing it. So you kind of have to be, if you're going to position yourself that way, you kind of have to be the pioneers in your market. So, 
talk, talk with me through that. I do. I do want to say that, you know, I'm a big proponent about pricing, about knowing your market and all these things. Um, and, and of course I am going to speak about this upon this, but you know, just raising your pricing, is not going to book you weddings. So you know that, I mean, it comes with the whole, like, you know, trifecta of, you know, uh, vendor relationships, uh, quality of films and just kind of like the branding you have and, um, you know, even your online presence, but assuming all those other things are in place, um, so you, you're just kind of like asking like how, how we would go about how, what we would say to people who are thinking about or who are in that similar situation where they're. How yeah. did we pioneer? Yeah, how did I, we I, raise I, our prices? Yeah, not necessarily what you would say to them, but just talk to me through maybe a little bit of the journey of how you went about trying to scale yourself up in that direction. Because I know, I mean, you said you changed your prices three times in the last couple of months. So um, <laughs> obviously it's very a, a very fluid thing for you guys. Um, we just went under, we had just underwent a pricing change two weeks ago ourselves. And so, um, we're trying to, you know, figure out all those conversations with people. And it's always a struggle, especially when you're communicating with the volume of people that we are, we've been communicating one price for, um, to them for a long time. And now they're coming back to book and, Oh, sorry, the price is this now. Just talk to me through your journey because it's a, uh, it's always a struggle. It's a, it's a fearful thing for a lot of people. Um, you know, am I going to price myself out of business? You know, just talk with me through that journey. Do you mind if I start or oh, do you okay. want to? Okay, go ahead. <laughs> you know, the pricing is the last thing that, um, that we did. Um, you know, the way our journey started was, you know, first re recognizing the fact that there really was nobody in that position as kind of like the leader of the pack in Atlanta. We felt, you know, we, we talked about how we focus on our cinematic side, you know, creating better films, which is the first thing that really people should be doing, focusing on focusing on your films and, you know, improving the quality of your films. And uh, for a lot in for a lot of creatives out there, because, you know, a lot of a lot of businesses or a lot of the, the, the wedding videographers who, you know, we talk to day in and day out of the forums, I would say most of them are actually creatives first and business people second. And they believe that based upon the, the merit of the film being good, that they should actually get better leads and better bookings from that. But that's only a piece of the puzzle. It's, it's you know, and for us, it's kind of like follow that same journey of first improving the films. Second, um, second uh, thing I have, or I put just going back to my notes is, you know, one of the big things that we did was we were very intentional about vendor relationships and, um, with vendor relationships, you know, I, I'm a part of, you know, multiple professional society, uh, organizations within Atlanta. And one of the things I tell people is that when I go to these organizations, I'm the, I, a lot of the time I'm the only videographer, you know, there's all these planners, photographers, venue people, and I'm the only videographer. And I'm, I have like pick of the litter when I go to these um, events. And, you know, I'm a very, inten and very intentional about being relational to them. You know, you can't go to these events and just hand a business card and say, hey, book me. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going I'm going out there and I'm, you know, I'm not even prospecting. I'm just making friends. Mm -hmm. I'm making friends in the industry. And, you know, I, I had, a, had the shifting of mindset that kind of ascends being just being known as a videographer and being known as a wedding professional in the area. And, you know, the kind of that, that transformation of, you know, kind of identity can really kind of put you within the same level as a lot of these other um, people, it, that these other w wedding industry professionals that you would want to have those types of relationships with. Mm -hmm. Did you want to? Well, I was going to say um, our journey really started. I mean, we wanted to raise our prices and we would shoot weddings. You know, we're charging $2,500 and the photographer that we shot with, we found out charged 10000 or like, okay, so this family definitely could have paid more <laughs> for us, but our yeah. price was that low, so they hired us. And so that happened a lot. We actually noticed that the caliber of photographers that we were working with were, were very high and high, high budget. Um, and so that made us more comfortable knowing that our market could support more expensive video. That's, that's a really important like uh, thing that you became aware of. Just, just like relating, relating photo to video, um, you know, because if they're paying that much for imagery, mm -hmm. like then we know that the market can support that. Like people mm -hmm. are willing to do that. So, and, and you guys have proven that to be true. But you know, it, it's kind of like, 
you know, when we were at that, that position five years ago, you know, it's like, it's a combination of, you know, going out to the, you know, I was going out to these events during the weddings. We were being very intentional about networking with the, with the vendors that we currently had. You know, we were intentional about, you know, making sure that, you know, planners got films that, you know, we were and just being relational to people because one of the things I discovered a long time ago is that people don't refer out the people who are the best. They refer out people who they like. Mm. Which was kind of like eye-opening because, you know, especially in a creative mindset, you think that people are just always going to refer out the best or at least the best at any given price point. But really what it comes down to is that you will re – and we'll do the same thing too. You know, if we have to give out referrals for anything, we don't think about who's best. We think about who we like and who we would want to have that business. Well, it would match the client. We'd it would match to, the client, of yeah. course. Sure. So. Yeah. Absolutely. So – um Let's talk a little bit more about, let's talk a little bit more about like that network that you guys have built. I know that you guys have invested uh, a ton of time into that network. Is it, is it primarily about these networking events? Are there other things that you are doing to help position yourself the way that you are? I was going to say, so he's the social butterfly. He goes to all the events. Um, he's making all the relationships and um, even on the wedding days, um, we're both intentional about trying to make relationships with people on the wedding day. Um, we don't want to step on anybody's toes too much. <laughs> like we'll try to get everything that we need. Um, and you know, most of the time the planners, the photographers are really cooperative. And, um, if you have a great wedding day and a great team and you come out at the end of the wedding day, you feel like great friends. And so that just sets you up for, um, referrals from them, but also again, just kind of building your network. You know, just responding to people on Facebook and just kind of like being known to them and being in the forefront of people's minds a lot. And um, even helping out uh, when people are kind of looking for other suggestions. You know, and honestly, one of the things I've done to position myself is that even when we're not available for, for, um, for planners and other people who are looking for leads, I actually connect them with other people who are. And what that's done is that that has kind of positioned me in a way that people still come to me. You know, because you, you always want people to come to you no matter what. And they want to know that even even if they're just looking for someone, they know you're a great resource. Just, you know, it, what I wanted to do is, especially when talking to you, I wanted to create some, like, practical tips that people can kind of take away and and utilize, you know, just for their for their own business. And I know the, a couple of these might even sound like dumb or corny or whatnot, but just it's with all these things put together, it's really helped us, you know, put together a network and have a lot of people who come to us and, you know, rely on us uh, for this type of information, you know, with, with getting vendors. Now, actually, I mean, we've been really intentional about building relationships with the wedding videographers in the area as well. Um, back in 2011, I think me and one other videographer, we connected, actually I found him and I felt so alone. Um, back then, you know, just working from home, trying to build a business. And I found another wedding videographer in Atlanta that I was like, oh my gosh, this stuff is decent. I want to, I want to reach out because I want a friend. And between the two of us, um, we decided to create this Facebook group and, um, we started attracting, um, and building that group of wedding videographers in the Atlanta area. And we have like this really cool little group, like this community. And we don't, Yes, we're competition, but we're there for each other. We refer each other. We help each other out. Let's say, you know, something happens to one of their shooters. They can come to the group and find a last minute replacement shooter. Um, and so that also, that network as well, I think really helps. Um, yeah. Awesome. I, I think. Well, so. uh, we need to start wrapping up the show. So what final <laughs> thoughts do you have? Um, let's talk to the the wedding filmmaker who um, is in terms of their position in their particular market. They feel like um, they're sort of middle of the road and struggling to go forward. What final thoughts do you want to share with those those folks? I would say, you know, from listening to a lot of people who are on these forums that a lot of people kind of want to be in this position, but most people aren't actually going to do what it takes to get there. You know, it's just, it's, there's a lot of work that goes into this. There's a lot of work on, you know, upping the quality of your films to just um, even focusing on the business side. And, you know, just a little bit of work can go a long way. And, you know, it, it, attaining that position, just like really start pushing the envelope on what you can do. You know, like, w just real quick, one of the things that we even did when we were, um, you know, kind of going back and figuring out, you know, how can we increase the quality of our films? It's a true funny, uh, funny story that um, 
you know, a, a lot of times I would do one or two hours of groom prep. And when, then I, I, a lot of times I didn't actually watch the films that were being created. And, you know, finally I started watching some of the films and I realized that I would do one or two hours of groom prep and Kay would only use one or two of my shots. <laughs> and it really helped me be able to focus in on, you know, what, what, what's a more valuable usage of my time that day and how can I be more effective in, you know, uh, do, going for the story of the day. I mean, uh, and on the business side, it's just, you know, knowing what I, what I like to say is know and be known in your industry. It's, it's a great first step. I mean, I, I know there's probably a dozen people who've gone on before us that have kind of harped on, you know, social media and this and that, and all those are great things too. But, you know, it's like most of what we built has actually been local. You know, we focused on the local community. We didn't, we didn't really focus on social media. And honestly, we don't get a lot of leads from like, you know, or at least we didn't initially get a lot of leads from people who are just like going to your YouTube page or Vimeo page or whatnot. It's like the st- the leads that we've gotten to build this business have been homegrown in our community and not like focus on the bigger picture. Um, something I do want to add uh, to booking is there, let's see, the saying is the fortune is in the follow-up. And so he is also like the follow-up king. He follows up and follows up and follows up and follows up. Um, and so I think that's huge. And I think a lot of people don't do that. I think a lot of people send out their stuff and they just pray. That's it. It's like yeah. spray and pray. That's yep. like, I, I, that's a, another term. I don't know what it's used for, but anyway, so, but that's, <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to do that. You want to just really hone in on all those people, um, and follow up and make sure you're servicing them. And, um, I mean, you want to, did you want to talk about the follow up at all? But. Yeah, I mean, if we have one more minute, I'm, guys, if there's one more thing I can say to you, and I, I don't want to say, and if, if you're from the Atlanta market, just feel free to tune me out. <laughs> but I can't tell you or I can't stress how many weddings I've booked just by being the first one to respond. I mean, it's crazy. I mean, I, I've booked weddings at 10, 11 o'clock at night. I've booked them in the morning. I booked one on a camping trip. And the thing is, you know, I, I know there's always that balance of life and family, but, you know, even Work if it's family. just... Even if it's just sending out a quick, hey, we're available over text. You know, we all know that a lot of people are now on uh, text messaging and I, I, we all book weddings and text messaging now. You know, just be the first one to respond. You know, it, I, get, I get time and time again, people are like, wow, I can't believe how quickly you got back to me. Yeah. And there's 10% of the weddings I'll book in five minutes just from just that initial contact. And, and also it's just like, Another really important thing about the whole booking process is, and I know it's kind of unpopular, get people on the phone. If you can get people on the phone, it, I mean, I, I, I always have the, like this little meter in my head for those of you who are watching, like, you know, how likely someone is to book. And I know that if I can get them on the phone speaking about their wedding and about their day, that, you know, the, the likelihood that they're going to book with you is going to go way higher. Yep. Because the thing is, we're all, we're all looking for connection. You know, some people are going to come and, and hire you just because you had the best film at the cheapest price, maybe just because you had the cheapest price. But there's a lot of people who are looking for a genuine connection. You know, videographers and photographers have a very intimate relationship with the bride and groom on the day of the wedding. And it, it, even if it's just a feeling that they have with you that you're good people and that you're real people, that that's enough to go on where a lot of people just be like, hey, look, we felt a connection and, um, uh, you know, we'd love to move forward. And one step further from a phone call is what's really popular right now as well is FaceTime or Skype video. Um, that even actually takes that relationship further, quicker. Yeah. So you'll really, when you see them face to face, and the fact that you're taking the time to do that and that you're willing to sit down with them like that, um, I think is even possibly more powerful than a phone call. So if people, for me, I don't really like the phone as much, but I have found face-to-face FaceTime is somehow easier. And I think it's just because I can see the mannerisms and kind of feel the person out a little bit better than just hearing their voice. So, I mean, that'd be my tip to people who don't like the phone is FaceTime is actually easier. Awesome. Well, if, if, uh, if our audience wants to go somewhere to find, uh, check out your work, where would you point them? Don't go to our website because we haven't updated in like a year. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will say this, like our, our Facebook is, or I'm sorry, our website is so out of date. Um, our Facebook is up to date um, at John, it's Facebook slash Jonathan and K. That's J-O-N-A-T-H-A-N-A-N-D-K-A-Y-E. Um, but our you, website is also jonathanandk.com as well. And you can find our, our Facebook through there. You can as find well. the best yeah. of our wedding films from 2016 on there right now. <laughs>
<laughs> awesome. Very cool. Well, it was great hanging out with you guys. Much appreciated. I know our audience will find a great deal of value here. So I am super appreciative. Yeah, thanks Thank you for, for having, having us. us. <laughs> All right. Y'all practice that one. <laughs> okay. Take care, guys. All right. Bye. Bye. Here we go now.